Today's lecturer is Taylor McAdam, who is uh, a postdoc here at the, the math department. Uh, Taylor grew up in Texas? California. And California, or just California? Just California. I went, went to, to school, school in Texas. Texas and California. He discovered around junior, in, in junior, like year, junior high year of high school that she liked math. So some of you have a head start. <laughs> um, and she graduated with a PhD from UC San Diego, and now she's here doing dynamics. And you're going to find out a little bit of what she does. So let's have a hand for Taylor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, as Yair said, I study dynamical systems. Um, what that means is you look at some sort of mathematical object, a space, and you apply some transformation to it. And you apply this transformation over and over and over again. And the kinds of questions that we ask in dynamical systems is what happens in the long term? For example, if, if I follow the path of a single point in my space, where does this path go? Does it end up concentrating somewhere? Does it repeat itself? Um, so these are the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, um, as I was saying, uh, dynamical systems have applications in all sorts of things, uh, such as um, predicting the motion of planets, uh, modeling the spread of disease. Um, it also has applications to more abstract, pure areas of math, like uh, studying the distribution of primes. Um, but I don't want to talk about any of those applications today. Uh, my goal today is to show you how even very simple systems can give rise to very complex behavior. Um, and also to introduce you, hopefully, to some of the ways that uh, mathematicians think about how complicated a system is. Um, because there's lots of different ways that we can think about this, and I want to introduce you to a few. Um, okay, so the hero of our story today is going to be the simple circle. This is the space that we're looking at, and I'm going to sort of compare and contrast the properties of uh, three different kinds of transformations of this circle. So what can we do to a circle where a very simple transformation we could apply to it is to rotate it. So if I start with a point, I can rotate it by some fixed angle. So here I've rotated it by a third of one full rotation. I can rotate it again, and if I rotate it again, I get back to where I started. Then if I keep rotating, I'm just going to repeat that same path over and over. So pretty simple. Um, so I just followed the path of one point on this circle. Um, what would happen if I looked at a different point on the circle? So now I ha have uh, our original path all in red, and we have another point um, in blue. So if we follow this point, we see it looks, the path of this point looks exactly the same as the path of the original point, right? Just rotated. Um, so in this, because of the symmetry of the circle, every path is going to look the same. Okay, so now I'll rotate by a different angle. So originally I was rotating by um, a third of a full rotation, now I'll ro rotate by two-fifths of a full rotation. All right, so I go around, I go around. Now this time I pass my original point. That's okay. Around, and then I get back to where I started. So, so far we've seen some rotations that always land uh, back where they started and eventually just repeat themselves over and over again. So let's try something maybe a little bit weirder of a number. All right, I'm going to rotate by this weird angle. Uh, looks like it might wrap around now. Uh, looks like it might meet back up to where it started, right? Well, not quite. OK. All right, now it really looks like it's going to meet back up. No, not quite. OK. All right, I'm not going to bore you with this for too much longer. But I can follow this, oops, follow this for quite a while. It's not really clear so far what it's going to do, right? Um, so what do you think will happen if it keeps going? Over there? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Do you think it will ever meet back up with where it started? No, because uh, right now it, it doesn't, so obviously it won't grow. Hmm. Well, I'll just leave that unanswered for now. Um, so the question that we have now is, we don't know what happens with this system, but seeing as we saw that it met back up, with itself, uh, the first two times, we might conjecture that if I rotate by the same amount, oops, over and over again, um, will I always return to where I started at some point? Will I always eventually return to where I started, maybe after making many, many loops around the circle? Um, so to investigate this question a little bit more mathematically, I want to think about the circle in a slightly different way. So imagine cutting the circle and unfolding it, and then lying it flat. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the circle has a um, circumference of 1. So I lie this flat, and I'm looking at the unit interval from 0 to 1. Um, but I have to remember that when I'm thinking about this unit interval, I'm thinking about it as the circle. So this point over here at 1, that's really connected to the point over at 0. Those two points are the same. And if I think about traveling along this interval, when I get to 1, I loop back around and go to 0. So what does a rotation look like when we're thinking about the circle as this unit interval where the two endpoints are considered to be the same? So let's look at that 2 fifths rotation again. OK? I go over to 2 fifths, then I end up at 4 fifths. Um, then if I was to keep going, I would get to 6 fifths or 1 and a fifth, right? But because this is the circle, it passes through 1, which is actually 0, and goes 1 fifth more of the way around the circle, right? So I don't really land over here at 1 and 1 fifth. That's not a point on my space. I really get taken back to one-fifth, right? OK. Then I keep going. I add two-fifths to one-fifth. I get three-fifths. I finally get back to where I started. And one is equal to zero. So what is happening here? <coughs> it seems like uh, on the interval, rotation by a fixed angle on the circle corresponds to addition by a fixed number, right? In this case, two-fifths. But we have this additional rule that if adding the number r resu results in a number greater than 1, then we need to get rid of the whole part and keep only the fractional part. Remember, that's what happened when we got to 1 and a fifth. We had to move it back into the unit interval by getting rid of the whole part, right? OK. So, Call this operation of keeping only the fractional part of a number, call that reducing it mod 1. And we're, for a number x, x mod 1 is where we get rid of the whole part and just keep the fractional part. So for example, if I take 20 thirds mod 1, that's the same as 6 and 2 thirds mod 1. The whole part is 6. I get rid of that. So 20, uh, 20 thirds mod 1 is equal to 2 thirds. Are there any questions about uh, this definition? Yeah. Um, so, sorry. Uh, keep knocking my charger out. Um, what does mod one mean? What does mod one mean? Yeah. Uh, for our purposes, it just means if you have a number, um, take the whole part of the number, meaning whatever part of the number, um, if you were to express it, for example, as a decimal, whatever comes before the decimal point, throw that away and keep only what comes after the decimal point. This way you're guaranteed to have a number that always lies between 0 and 1, right? Because we're thinking of our circle as, as the unit interval, all of our numbers should lie between 0 and 1. 
So um, in this language, a rotation on the circle corresponds to adding a number r and then reducing mod 1. So this is what our rotation corresponds to. Um, if we rotate twice, it's not immediately obvious, but if I add a number, reduce mod 1, and then add a number, and then reduce mod 1, I get the same thing as if I added the number twice and then reduced mod 1. And I have a little diagram to sort of show what's going on. So I add a number, that's blue. I reduce mod 1, that's the arrow in red, taking me back to the unit interval here. So this not dashed line is my unit interval. Then I add a number again, the same amount, and then I reduce again, and I get to the blue point. So we'll leave that blue point up there. Then if I add and then add, I go a little bit further over, but still, now I want to move this point back to its same place, but on the very first interval, and that lines right back up with that blue point. So more generally, if we start um, from some number x and we rotate by r n times, that's the same as um, adding n times r to x and then reducing mod 1. So basically all I'm saying in this slide is that we can do all of the reducing mod 1 at the end. That's not a problem. OK, um, now I'm going to take a brief digression. A number is called rational if it can be written as a ratio of integers. So we have some examples here, um, one third, two. It's not obviously written as a ratio of integers, but I can write it as two over one. Um, I can take negative numbers, that's fine. Anything can, that can be written in this way is called a rational number. If it's not possible to write a number as a ratio of integers, then call it irrational. Um, it's maybe even surprising that such numbers exist, but they do. I'm not going to prove that today, but if you're interested, you can talk, talk to me about it after the lecture. Um, so some familiar examples, square root of 2, pi, Euler's number e, if you're familiar with it. These are all irrational numbers. Um, so an equivalent definition that we could give is that a number is rational if and only if its decimal expansion eventually terminates or repeats. This is maybe the definition that you've heard, if you've heard of it before. Um, this is a little bit of a pet peeve, but technically we don't really need to say terminates, because if it terminates, it's really just zero repeating. Uh, so a number is irrational then, if and only if its decimal expansion is non-repeating. That doesn't mean that it never has some you know, string of numbers that it can repeat you know, down the line, but what it means is that it's never repeating the same thing forever and ever and ever. Um, so we have famously the digits of pi, never repeat. Um, there are also less sort of random looking examples of irrational numbers. So this number here, one zero one zero zero one zero 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 one zero 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 however many zeros. Um, this is also irrational, even though it's clearly sort of very ordered, um, but it never repeats because I'm always adding more zeros in between each of the ones. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on and so forth. Also irrational. Um, of course, there are many, many, many more examples. Um, OK, so we saw that rotations by one-third and two-fifths eventually closed up and repeated themselves. So maybe instead of making the, the very bold conjecture that all uh, paths will eventually repeat themselves, maybe we want to be a little bit more uh, conservative and just ask whether all rational rotations end this way. OK, so let's say our rotation r is a, a rational number, which means it can be written as <coughs> m over n, where m and n are integers. 
Um, what happens when we have rotated n times? Well, we said that a rotation n times is equal to x plus nr mod 1. Since r is equal to m over n, we get n times m over n. The n's cancel. So we have x plus m mod 1. But now notice that m is an integer, and x was a point on the unit interval, meaning x was a number that we started with that was between 0 and 1, right? So this is an integer plus something that's between 0 and 1. So that is the whole part. m is the whole part, and x is the fractional part. So what mod 1 does is it just returns x. And that's where we started. We started from the point x. We rotated n, uh, n times, and we got back to the point x. So in fact, <coughs> every rational rotation will eventually repeat itself. Every rational rotation will eventually come back to where it started. Um, so here's another definition, a bit of terminology. The orbit of a point is the collection of all points that it will eventually reach when we apply our transformation over and over. So it's the path that the point, the point takes. So as we saw with the two-fifths example, um, the set of points that it hits is 0, 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths. And we could throw 1 in there, but 1 is equal to 0. Um, OK, for a rational rotation in the form of m over n, how many distinct points will be in the orbit of a point on the circle. Does anybody want to venture a guess? Yeah? Uh, I, I think that uh, the number of points will be equal to uh, the How many points there would be depends on the denominator? Yes. Of Interesting. Why do you say that? Because uh, for two fifths, uh, we have five points, and five, the five is part of the denominator of two fifths. Right. And for uh, one third, we had three points, right? Um, so that's a very good guess. And uh, it's basically correct. What if I had, for example, what if I rotated by two fourths? Right. So, so maybe we need to be a little bit careful in how we phrase it. But uh, yeah, basically, the denominator when the fraction is in lo lowest terms. Um, great. What? M is 22 and, and N is 7. Uh, so you're asking if the numerator is bigger than the denominator? Sorry. If, if substituting it's pi. He's substituting pi for the number. 22 by 7. 42 over 7. Yeah, but. Pi. No, M by N. M is 22, N is 7. So that's irrational. That's pi. But so here, the rotations correspond to percentages of, um, of the circle. So we're not using radians. Is that clear? So no. that. I think his question is, how does the irrational numbers work? Oh, well, that, we're, we're, about to, we're about to talk about that. Right. No, it's 22 by 7 is irrational. Yes. 22 by 7 is not irrational. It's pi. It's a value of pi. 22 by 7 is pi, so it is in Russian. Not exactly. It's not exactly pi. 22 pi. by 7 is an approximation to pi. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not pi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it, and it is, it, it is, in fact, rational, because it can be written as a ratio of integers. Yeah, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to know. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. 22 over 7 is, is close to pi, but it's not exactly pi. And it is rational, but pi is not rational. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, OK, so we saw that if we have a rational rotation, then our, our orbit eventually comes back to where it started. Um, we could sort of ask the reverse question. If I have an orbit that I know it comes back to where it started, what can I say about the amount r that I rotated by? 
Um, since we already said that all orbits look the same, just rotated, um, let's just consider the orbit of the point zero. Okay, so our assumption is that I rotate some number of times, n, and I get back to where I started. Since I started at zero, this means I have zero plus nr, that's my n rotations, I reduce mod one and I get zero. But if something mod one equals zero, that means it has no fractional part, right? Which means that it must be equal to some integer. The only numbers that have no fractional parts are integers. Um, this means that n times r is equal to some integer m, which means that r is equal to m over n, so r is in fact a rational number. So what we've shown is that um, a rotation closes up and repeats if and only if r is a rational number. In particular, this means that a rotation by an irrational number will never, ever, ever close up. It never repeats itself, it never returns to where it started. There are infinitely many points in the orbit of an irrational, uh, sorry, in an irrational orbit, an orbit by an irrational rotation. Um, so we can say something that's even stronger than that, right? We know, or we've, we've just shown that um, a rotation by an irrational amount will uh, never repeat itself, but we can actually say that not only does it just not repeat itself, it essentially goes everywhere. Um, by that we mean um, the trajectory of the point, the orbit, will eventually enter any interval, no matter how small that interval is. <coughs> and uh, in math, we call that being dense. Okay, so how can we see this? So suppose there was an interval of length L that was not hit. What we're going to do is something that we call a proof by contradiction. And the way this works is I'm trying to show that every interval is hit. So I'm going to assume the opposite, that there's some interval that's not hit, and I'm going to show that that leads to something impossible. So basically, it's impossible that there is an interval that is not hit, which means every interval is hit. Um, so suppose there's an interval of length L that's not hit. So first I want to make the observation that if there are any two points that get within L of each other, then every interval of length L will contain a point in the orbit. So just pictorially, if I have an orbit and two points get within L of each other, then as I loop, so I, got, I went three times around and got within L. If I loop three times again, so I'll just do it in quick succession. Boop, boop, boop. Then I'm within L again. Boop, 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 within L again. And I can keep doing this, so this is kind of like what you were saying. Um, and I can basically fill up the whole circle with points that are within L of each other. So what this means is that if I'm, by assumption, there's an interval of length L that's not hit, that means that there can't be any two points that are within L of each other, because if there were any two points that were within L of each other, then every interval of length L would be hit. So all of the points in the orbit, under my assumption, have to be at least distance L apart. But we also already showed that there are infinitely many distinct points in the orbit of an irrational rotation. That means that we have infinitely many points, all separated by distance L. The circle would have to have infinite length to contain all those points. But that's impossible. So the assumption that we made at the beginning, that there's some interval of length L that's not hit, that had to be false. That shows that every interval is eventually hit by the orbit of our irrational rotation. Yeah? So uh, your assumption contradicts that the point has a size. And point does not have a size. Uh, it, mm, it doesn't. 
we're not assuming that the point, the point doesn't take up any space. So between any two, uh, the length L that you're assuming, uh, that length will, will always be changing. So a the circle, when uh, made into a straight line, will be actually an infinite line, technically. Uh, the points are too small. So you'll keep getting new Ls. N no. So we're just taking a circle, cutting it, without stretching it, just laying it down. So it'll have exactly the length of the original circle. Right, so your discussion here is if you have infinite number of L's, each of different length. Each of, no, 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 it's not each of different length. So the observation that we made is if we have some, uh, some point, two points in the orbit that get within L of each other, then by just going around multiple, multiple, multiple times, I can fill up the whole circle with the same with uh, points that are within the same L of each other. Oops. These lengths are all the same here. The lengths between the points that are close to close together. Um, Does that answer your question? Okay. Feel free to talk, talk to me after also. Um, okay. So this shows that the orbit of a point for an irrational rotation basically fills up the circle. That isn't to say that it hits every point, because it doesn't, but it enters any interval even if the interval is really super, super, super tiny. Um, so that's pretty cool, I think. Um, but we can ask an even finer question than that, which is, OK, so I know that uh, for an irrational rotation, if I keep going over and over and over again, my orbit is eventually filling up the circle. But does it spend equal amounts of time in all parts of the circle? So let me uh, just quickly demonstrate that um, this isn't the same question that we were originally asking. You could imagine, for example, that um, I had some transformation, which I'm not going to say you know, how the transformation is defined, but it's possible to imagine that for every point that I put on this side of the circle in an orbit, I get two points on this side of the circle. So as I'm going around, I add a point here and then two here. And then I add a point here and two here. Here and two here. And by adding points to both of these sides, I could fill up both regions. But at every point in time, this half of the circle has more points in it than this half of the circle, right? So even though for this imaginary transformation, um, the orbit that I'm describing here is dense, it spends more time in this half of the circle than it does in this half of the circle. Is that um, clear that these are sort of slightly different questions? OK, awesome. OK, so this leads us to uh, one of the notions of complexity I was talking about uh, earlier. So in dynamical systems, we call a system ergodic if the orbit of a randomly chosen point spends proportionate amount of times in all regions of the space. This means that. The trajectory of the point should spend half its time in any region taking up half of the space. It should spend a third of its time in any region taking up a third of, its, of the whole space, and so on and so forth. Right? If I take any region, whatever proportion of the space that that takes up, that's how often the orbit should be visiting that space. OK, so let's start with the rational rotations. Is rotation by a rational number r? Ergodic. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? No. Yeah. No? 
Uh, no? Why? I think it, it goes equally both the sides. When it's rotating mm -hmm. during the circle, it goes equally both the sides. Right. So, but to be ergodic, um, I'm not just thinking of sort of, or yeah, I'm not just thinking of one particular splitting or even a splitting into halves. What I need in order to be ergodic is that any subset, whatever proportion of the space that takes up, that's the amount that the orbit lands in it. Okay, let me, let me collect it then. Uh, yeah. It's not uh, uh, equally both the sides, equally maybe across the circumference of the circle. So do you think that it is ergodic or is not ergodic? It is not ergodic. Um, you're right that it is not ergodic. Um, the reason is basically because a randomly chosen point, let's look at a third, right? A randomly chosen point just repeats these three points over and over and over again, right? So here's a, a, a subset of the space that takes up some positive proportion of the space, how much time does this orbit spend in this subset? Zero. None, exactly. So it doesn't spend proportionate amounts of time in all sets, right? That means that it's not ergodic. OK, so is a rotation by an irrational number ergodic? I've, I see some heads shaking. That's a good intuition. Yes, it is ergodic. Um, how can we see this? It's not immediately obvious. Um, uh, yeah. Well, you know how we talked about L before? Mm -hmm. um, we're irrational numbers every time, like they add a point to the number L. So if it's an L, that means that it has to spend uh, more time. It has to spend some time, at least. Is that? Well, it's moving. Um, yeah, so you, you might be saying something along the lines of what I'm about to show. Okay, so we're going to do a similar thing to what we did. Um, we're going to do a proof by contradiction, meaning I'm going to assume I have some interval um, where it doesn't spend a proportionate amount of time. And just to make my life simpler, I'm going to assume that this interval has length 1 over n. Um, this is basically OK, because you can sort of get the general case from this case. But um, we're just going to assume that there's an interval of length 1 over n in which the orbit spends more than 1 over n proportion of its time. OK? We could also assume that it spends less than that amount. The proof would go basically the same way. OK. So since the, the, the first observation that we have here is since the orbit is dense, we know that there's a point y, which is basically 1 over n away from the starting point, right? In the orbit. This is a point y in the orbit that is 1 over n away from the starting point. Our second observation, which we've already used before, is that all orbits look the same, just rotated. So since y is 1 over n away from x, its orbit should look just like the orbit of x, but rotated by 1 over n. That means that um, y has a sort of extra dense region in a region that is right next to the extra den dense region in the orbit of x. So now we're considering two orbits, the orbit of x and the orbit of y. y is a point in the orbit of x, somewhere sort of you know, further down the line. Because y is, uh, because of this property that all orbits look the same, we know that there has to be a dense region for y next to the dense region for x. Our third observation is that since the orbit consists of infinitely many points, it doesn't affect the overall distribution of points if we ignore some finite number of points at the beginning of the orbit. We have infinitely many at the end to make up for it, right? Y is just some point in the orbit of x, some you know, 
some time in the future. That means that um, if we ignore the points between y, uh, y and x, these two distributions should be the same, which means that since this region here was extra dense for y, it also has to be extra dense for x. That means that while we just started by assuming that x had an extra dense region here, what we've shown is that, in fact, it has an extra dense region here and here. OK, but we could repeat this same logic, right? For another point, y, or z, say, that's you know, 1 over n further down the line. And by the same exact logic, we'd get that, actually, x has to have an extra dense region here, here, and here. This whole region has to be extra dense, containing more than its fair share of points. And using that same logic, we could fill up the whole circle with n intervals of length 1 over n, each of which we're supposing has more than its fair share of points. But how could the whole circle have more than its fair share of points? That's saying that the circle would have greater than 100% of the points. But that's impossible. So our assumption that there was some interval that had more than its fair share of points, that had to be false. It led to something that just doesn't make any sense. Um, any questions about this? Okay. Um, okay, so, so far we've looked at rational uh, rotations and irrational rotations. Um, we saw that in the case of rational rotations, they always just close up and repeat themselves over and over forever. And rational rotations were not ergodic because they don't spend equal amounts of time uh, in all parts of the space. The orbit of any point doesn't spend time in most of the space. It only hits a finite set. Um, we saw that for an irrational rotation, the, the story's a little bit more complicated. <coughs> for an irrational rotation, the orbit of any point is, in fact, infinite. Oh. I apologize. Um, for an irrational rotation, the orbit of any point is infinite. Not only is it infinite, it's also dense. It fills up the whole circle. Not only is it dense, it's, uh, the orbit of every point spends equal amounts of time in all areas of the space. Um, so an irrational rotation we see is more complicated, in some sense of the word, than an irrational rotation. Um, but in some sense, it still seems very simple, right? It's just a rotation. So let's look at two points and rotate by an irrational number. <coughs> uh, so my points here are in uh, red and blue. I rotate, I rotate, I rotate, I rotate, I rotate, I rotate. Oops. Um, Sorry. OK. So based on what we've been seeing, if I tell you where the blue point is at time n equals 1,000, can you tell me where the red point is? Yeah. I mean, look, we've, we've, we've watched them. They just stick together. They're not getting farther or closer apart. So if you know where the blue point is, you know exactly where the red point is, right? So even though this transformation is sort of complicated in one sense, it's also pretty simple in another sense. Um, in math, this is sort of doesn't have a really strict definition, um, but a system generally is called chaotic if it's highly sensitive to initial conditions. Um, and what this means is that if I look at two nearby points, and I look at some time far, far in the future as I'm applying my transformation over and over again, if I know the position of one point for a chaotic system, it doesn't tell me anything about where the other point is going to be. So basically, even if the points started really, really close together, and they sort of stay close together for some time, eventually they diverge and just become completely 
uncorrelated with each other, just doing their own thing. So even though irrational rotations were complicated in one sense, being ergodic, um, they're not complicated in a different sense. They're not chaotic, not even close. So now I want to switch gears. We've been talking about rotations for a while, and I want to talk about a different transformation of the circle. Um, so what we saw was when we thought of the circle as an interval, we laid it flat. Um, rotation corresponding to adding some fixed number over and over again and then reducing mod 1, right? Throwing away the, uh, the whole part and keeping just the fractional part. So what if instead of adding some fixed number over and over again, we decide to multiply by some fixed number over and over again and then reduce mod 1? Okay, so for a point on the interval representing a point in our circle, um, define the times 10 map to be multiply that point by 10 and then reduce mod 1. So geometrically what is, this is doing is multiplying by 10 is taking our unit interval and stretching it out to length 10 and then basically wrapping it around the unit interval 10 times. So we stretch it out and then we wrap it back around the circle and sort of collapse it and see where all the points go. So I've uh, indicated some points here, red, blue, and green. We see where they go when they get stretched out. Then you take this stretched out part and you press it down onto the circle. This is what the times 10 map is, is doing. Okay, so let's see what it's doing in a concrete example. So let's take the point x equals 0.149. Uh, okay, I multiply by 10. I get 6.149. I reduce mod 1, so I get rid of the 6 and keep just the fractional part, 0.149. Okay, so I've illustrated that on the interval. Now if I plug that back in and I do the same transformation to it, 10 times uh, 0.149 is 1.49. I reduce mod 1, so I get rid of the whole part, and I'm left with just 0.49. Okay? Once again, uh, I multiply by 10, 4.9. I get rid of the 4, leave the 0.9. And then finally, I multiply 0.9 by 10, I get 9. 9 is an integer, there is no fractional part left, so when I reduce mod 1, I just get back to 0. And then once I'm at 0, I just keep getting 0 <laughs> over and over and over again forever, right? No matter how many times I plug this back into the same transformation, I'm always going to get 0 out. So what the times 10 map is doing is what we've seen is um, it's shifting the decimal place. If we write our number out as an infinite decimal expansion, the times 10 math just shifts the decimal place one over and then gets rid of everything before the decimal. So, pretty simple to describe algebraically. Perhaps not so simple to describe dynamically. Um, what do the orbits of different kinds of points look like? Well, we saw that for x equals 0, it's just fixed, right? If I plug 0, I multiply by 10, I reduce mod 1, I just get 0. Um, what about uh, 1 third, 0.33333 repeating? What happens when I apply my transformation to this over and over again? Yeah? That's a very good question. Um, we'll see that in just a moment. Um, but you're right, this is, this is a fixed point. Because if I multiply by 10, I get 3.333333. I throw away the 3, I still have 0.333333 repeating. Oops. Um, this is the example that we just saw. We saw that for a number like this, which terminates, it moves around for a little bit, and then it eventually just ends at 0. right? Here's a repeating number. Uh, so this is a rational number because it's 
Decimal expansion repeats over and over again, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, so here, it's not fixed, but it does repeat. If I move it, uh, if I move the decimal place one over, I get two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. If I move it one over again, I get three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. If I move it over again, I get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, back to where I started. So this is um, an orbit that is sort of similar to the um, rational rotations that we saw. It's just repeats the same three numbers over and over again, over and over again for infinity. Um, so one interesting thing to note is that in the case of both rotations, rational or irrational, all of the orbits looked the same. For one given map, all of the orbits looked the same for every point on the circle, right? Here we're seeing a very different kind of behavior. We're, we're considering the same map times 10. We haven't changed the transformation at all. But plugging in different points gives us very different kinds of behavior. Um, so as you were mentioning, um, the orbit of a rational number will always uh, eventually stabilize or repeat itself um, because its decimal representation repeats itself. And since times 10 is just moving the decimal place over, if the decimal expansion repeats, then the, uh, applying the times 10 map will eventually get back to where we started. Um, but this still begs the question, what do the orbits of irrational numbers look like? OK, so let's do an example. Um, if I take pi, get rid of the 3, because we're looking at a point on the circle. Um, 0.141592, um, so I mapped this out for a little while. OK, sort of doesn't look really very ordered, right? It's sort of just bopping around all over the place. Um, and I skipped ahead a bunch, but uh, yeah. Eventually, it looks like it's basically filling in the whole circle, right? It looks like the behavior that we saw with the um, irrational rotations, where as we go on and on and on forever, um, it's just going to fill up the whole circle. So this, uh, this sort of raises the question, is the orbit of every irrational number dense in the circle for the times 10 map? Does anybody have a guess? Yeah. Uh, I think yes. Why do you think yes? Uh, well, I think yes because um, but, but at the end of the <coughs> when the whole that that one four one five uh, point, it was all uh, like it was all covered. So eventually. When we use the times 10 map, it will get covered because if it's irrational like we saw before, it's going to get covered. We definitely know that it's not going to repeat. And that sort of makes it seem like it should cover the circle, right? Like it should go everywhere. But is that necessarily the case? Does anybody else have a guess? Yeah. Definitely, the, the number of points will be infinite. So that means the number of pi will be infinite. It'll have an infinite number of points in the orbit. So that doesn't mean it denses. It might go on the same point, but not exactly the same, same exact. Um, could you repeat the question? So if it's not going to dense up all around the circle, it's going to dense up on a couple. Ah, OK. Yeah, so that's exactly, yeah, great. That's, that's the thing that we might be worried about, right? Um, that maybe, even though there are an infinite number of points, they sort of cluster in certain parts, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's a great question. And uh, in fact, not necessarily, not every irrational orbit will fill in the circle. Um, so let's take this example. It's, now, it's not going to look very nice because, well, I did the best I could. Uh, <laughs> but this is similar to that one that we saw earlier, where we have five with zero zeros, five, one zero, five, two zeros, five, three zeros, five, four zeros, and so on and so forth. So as we noted before, that's an irrational number because it never repeats. Um, 
But it's also pretty clearly not going to go everywhere, right? Because if it was going to go everywhere, you would expect only two numbers appear in this expansion, right? So we're not going to get close to any numbers that have nines or sevens or twos in their decimal expansion. Um, and if we look at what this does, I made the points smaller than I did before because they sort of get clustered very, very quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and that's basically all you can see after that. So it looks like it's repeating the same points over and over, but it's actually not. It's just that these points are getting really close together. So it keeps bouncing back and forth between these two sides of the circle, and it keeps getting closer and closer to just a handful of points. And it'll sort of never leave this region. Oh, I was going backwards. So this is an irrational number, um, the orbit of which never repeats itself. It has infinitely many points. But we can see that, really, it's not very dense in the circle at all. So this orbit never repeats, but also doesn't sort of go everywhere. Um, so recall, this is just the same definition that we had earlier. Recall that um, a system is called ergodic if the orbit of a randomly chosen point spends proportionate amounts of time in all regions of the space. OK. So we've seen that um, for every rational number, the orbit will not be go everywhere equally, right? Because for a rational number, it's always either repeats itself or terminates, which is also repeating itself. Um, we saw that for, even for some irrational numbers, the orbit won't go everywhere. So for the times 10 map, how could it possibly be ergodic if we've seen that every rational number doesn't go everywhere? Even some irrational numbers don't go everywhere. Does anybody have a guess as to whether this map is ergodic or not? The times 10 map, is this ergodic? Yeah. yeah. So you think it was or was not ergodic? Is. <coughs> is. OK, what do you think? I think it's not ergodic. Why do you think that? Well, because um, it, does, it doesn't, fall, it doesn't uh, spend proportionate amounts of time like in their own space. Right. So we've definitely seen that there are many, many points that do not spend proportionate amounts of time in all areas of the space. But there's something that uh, we didn't really talk about very much in the last time we saw this definition, because last time we saw this definition, every point does the same thing for a, a Rotation, all of the orbits look the same. But this part of the definition is actually very important. A system is called ergodic if the orbit of a randomly chosen point spends proportionate amount of time in all regions of the space. A random point can be thought of as one with an infinite decimal expansion that you get just by rolling a 10-sided die over and over and over again. That's a random point. And I claim that, in fact, according to this, this definition, the times 10 map is ergodic, even though there are many points which don't go everywhere in the space equally. If you just pick a point at random, that point will go everywhere in the space equally. So, I want to actually do a little demonstration. Can I have a volunteer? You don't have to do anything uh, very exciting. Um, here. Let me get some. So I actually have 10-sided dice. So let's construct a random number here. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just roll that for me over and over again and read the digits that, that come out. All right. 
zero. Six. Nine. Seven. Three. Wow. I'm actually surprised there are no repetitions so far. Six. OK, we have a repeated number now. Five. Three. Okay, let's get like one more. Zero. Okay. And then imagine that we kept doing that forever, right? Thank you very much. Um, all right, look at this number. Does this look like any of the, the numbers that we saw that had orbits that didn't go everywhere? It looks more like pi, right? It doesn't look like five, zero, five, zero, zero, five, zero, zero, zero. It also doesn't look like a rational number that repeats itself over and over and over again. What do you think the odds are? If we kept rolling that dice infinitely often, just forever and ever and ever, what do you think the odds are that you would end up just rolling the same sequence of digits exactly the same in order forever? Very high? <laughs> None, right? But is, if you kept rolling forever and ever and ever, you, uh, um, if you kept rolling forever, you would never get a repeating number. A rational number is just not very likely. Um, and neither is one of these you know, irrational numbers that have sort of hidden structure and hidden order. If we take a randomly chosen number in the way that we just constructed, then it will spend proportionate amounts of time in all regions of the space. Um, OK, so let's just sort of give a heuristic argument for why that is. Each digit is equally likely to be rolled, right? That means that each digit should appear equally often, often in the decimal re representation. We were even sort of starting to see that, even though this is only the first few digits of the number. When a digit appears in the decimal expansion, under the times 10 map, it will eventually get moved to become the first decimal place, right? Because that's what the time, times 10 map does. It just moves everything uh, to the left. To the left. Um, OK. The first decimal place determines which of these 10 regions a point falls into, right? We have our whole interval between 0 and 1. All of the numbers that start with 0 are going to be in the first interval. All of the numbers that start with 1 are going to be in the second interval. All of the numbers that start with 2, so on and so forth to all of the numbers that are right before 1 start with a 9, right? This is just how the, the ordering on the number system, our, our number system is. Um, that means that the trajectory spends equal amounts of time in each of these regions. Because each of the 10 digits comes up equally often, and each time a digit comes up, it's going to eventually become the first digit. The first digit tells you where your point is falling, so if I look at my points as I keep shifting, I'm going to fall into these regions with equal probability. And that just says, you know, at this sort of level that I'm falling into each of these regions with equal probability. Maybe I fall into each of these re regions with equal probability, but inside one of these regions, I have like an extra dense spot. You might be worried about that, right? Maybe each of these has equal probability, but Right in the middle of this interval, there's an extra dense spot. Well, each roll is also independent of all of the rolls that came before it. That means that if I look at two digit sequences, 0, 0 is just as likely to come up as 0, 1, or 0, 2, or 0, 9, or 1, 0, or any other two digit sequence, right? So all two-digit sequences are equally likely. Two-digit sequences correspond to taking that, uh, those intervals we had earlier and subdividing each of those into 10 regions. So I just zoomed in around the number 1 here, 
but these are two-digit sequences starting with 0, 07, starting with 0, 08, starting with 0, 09, starting with 10, starting with 11, one, one, starting with 12. Right? And because each of these two-digit sequences are equally likely, and our times 10 map will eventually take each of these two-digit sequences to the front of the number, then as we use our times 10 map over and over and over again, where the points land will enter each of these regions, these smaller subdivided regions, with equal probability. And of course, we can sort of repeat this logic over and over again to divide them into um, each region into 10 more regions, which corresponds to three-digit sequences, all of which are equally likely, which implies that the tra trajectory of our point will fa fall into each of these equally likely, and we can keep subdividing and subdividing and subdividing to where we can say, you know, the orbit of our point is going into regions as tiny as we want um, with equal probability. So really, the orbit of our point goes everywhere with equal likelihood. Um, okay. So <laughs> in the case of an irrational rotation, we saw that uh, rotation by an irrational number was ergodic, but it was not chaotic, right? Remember that chaotic means that if I take two points starting close together and I know where one of the points is far in the future, that doesn't tell me anything about where the other point is, even if the two points started really, really close together. So let's take an example. Here are just two random numbers. Um, I have them, I'm having them start out close together. So you can see the red and the blue. They're really close together. You might not even be able to tell them apart. But one is red and one is blue, x and y. The fact that they're close together means that they start with the same sequence, 4, 9. Okay, if we apply the times 10 map, they moved over here. They moved a little bit apart, but they're still pretty close together, right? Okay, now I applied the times 10 map one more time. Okay, they, they moved pretty far apart now. And, um, okay, it's just sort of doing random stuff, right? Okay, so if I asked you, if I told you at a time 1,000, at 1,000 steps in the future of applying the times 10 map, this is where the blue dot is. Can you tell me where the red dot is? <laughs> no. Yes? <laughs> um, no, right? The, j just by looking at what it was doing, it's not clear at all where the red point should be, right? I, it could be close. It could be far. It was, they were moving together and apart and together and apart. I don't know. Um, so two points together more or less means that their decimal expansions start with the same sequence, right? So these two points start really, really close together. If I was to show them on the circle, like you wouldn't even be able to tell them apart. But once I've rotated, uh, not rotated, once I've applied the times 10 map four times, now they just look like two completely random unrelated points, right? So nearby points won't remain close after the times 10 map shifts them beyond their shared initial sequence. So this tells us that the times 10 map is both ergodic and chaotic. So it's sort of more complicated than the irrational rotation in a very important way. Um, so this is how I'll end my, my lecture with a challenge. Um, by looking at decimal expansions, try to come up with as many different kinds of orbits as you can think of for the times 10 map. There's lots and lots and lots of them. Um, okay, thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk, and I hope you enjoyed it.